All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Last Wednesday night, we uh, started a, a short little study on what it looks like to create a healthy culture within a church. And we kind of laid out some areas of um, concern, not concern in a bad way, but in some areas of concern where we want to be intentional with what we do as a church. And I, I want to review those briefly and then... Tonight, we're actually going to look through a passage of Scripture here in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to just go ahead and read this passage, then we'll pray, and then we will dive in. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. For building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for this day which you've given to us, and we thank you for uh, the opportunity to gather together to worship you and to hear a report of the works that you're doing in your church here at Lake Fork. Father, we thank you that you are meeting all of our needs perfectly. We pray, O oh God, that you will grant us the wisdom and the discernment and the faith needed to live on mission for you. Father, as you open doors, let us walk through them by faith. We pray that as we have this time of study tonight, you'll enlighten us and challenge us. We pray for the youth as they gather tonight, Father, and we ask that there will be a time where they can worship and be encouraged. We thank you for Bob and Lindy and for their loving on these students and encouraging them. God, just bless them tonight as your gospel is shared. We pray for our church family on Sunday as we uh, welcome our student minister candidate. And we pray, God, that it will be a weekend that is filled with excitement uh, and anticipation. We pray for the children as they gather tonight. Bless Sharon as she teaches them and those that are volunteering with them. And God, we pray that as your gospel is shared, lives will be changed. Lord, if there's any in this place tonight that do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we pray that that will change and that we'll give you glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So last Wednesday night, I know some of you had traveled down to Canton to go uh, to the East Texas camp meeting, and then we actually kind of kept it short uh, last Wednesday night, and some of us traveled down there. I know Ben and, and Tracy traveled down, and I think some others there, the, the Masons are already there. They skipped out from here and just went there, but they saved a seat, so I can't, you know, I can't, I can't be upset about that, but it, it was a good time, and they let me hold 
uh, Jetson, and then he spit up on Deanna. It was just a great time. It was just, you know, and then he really got JJ. So it was a good night. We had a fun time down there. But before all of that good stuff started, we started up here in talking about what it looks like to build the right culture within a local church. And we asked the question, what kind of culture do we want in Lake Fork Baptist Church? And when we're talking about culture, what we're talking about are the agreed upon values and practices of a group. Now, culture is something that you can't always maybe put a definition to in words, but you can see it defined in our actions, in our beliefs, and in our values. And so when we're talking about culture, what we're talking about are, are what are the things that we value and that we practice as a family of believers. And so there's four things that we talked about. One was we talked about we want to have a culture of integrity within the church. We want to have a culture of integrity. We want to do that by being serious about our own personal walk and relationship with God, but also we want to be serious with our integrity when it comes to guarding one another's reputation. We want to be careful about how we speak of others and about how we allow others to be spoken of to us. You know, sometimes we get into conversations where the best thing we can do is say, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to talk about that with you right now. And then sometimes we have to leave. <laughs> and it seems kind of rude. But it can't be any more rude than letting someone obliterate, you know, just obliterate somebody else. And so we want to have integrity as we care for one another. Another thing we want to see in our culture here at Lake Fork Baptist is we want joy and satisfaction in the work and the ministries which we do together. Work is a blessing from God. Service in the church is a blessing from God. Our aim should be to see one another maturing to the point of Christian service within the church. And so I want to work, I want to live, I want to serve with such joy and satisfaction that you want what I got. And what I got is God's spirit living in me. And what I've got is I've got the example of many, many untold others who have set the example of faithful and joyful service within the church. I want to be that for you. Third word we talked about is partnership. Ministry is partnership. We are partners together extending the gospel of Jesus Christ to those around us. There are certain things which I've been assigned by God to do as pastor. But that doesn't mean that I can't help David in his areas of ministry. It doesn't mean I can't help Tracy in his areas of ministry or Sharon in her areas of ministry or the maintenance and janitors in their area of ministry. You know, I want to challenge you to do something. I want to challenge you anytime, you don't have to do this in the bathrooms, but anytime other than the bathroom, you see just a little piece of trash or something, would you just pick it up and put it in the nearest trash can? Whether it was there on purpose or accident, if you would do that, then I promise you there will be a powerful ripple effect go throughout the whole church. Because what we would be doing is we would be setting the, the tone of we care about what God has blessed us with in these facilities. And we want to take care of them and we want to limit distractions so that those who are here can be focused on God. That, that's just a real simple way that we can partner together. And then the fourth word is excellence. And everything we do, whether it's worship services or ministries or vacation Bible school or Bible studies or fellowships, visitation, whatever it is, and everything we do, we want to do it 150%. I mean, we want to do it the best we can and then some because we want to be honoring God with our actions and our mindset as we prepare. So that, that's kind of the culture we talked about desiring to have in Lake Fork Baptist Church. But the question we ended on is where do we start in order to achieve that culture? Where do we start in order to achieve that culture? And the answer is we begin with unity. We begin with unity. And that's what Ephesians chapter 4 is about. I want to look at this this evening. We'll look at these first six verses first. As we talk about achieving this culture within the church and using unity to do that, we have to realize that this, this achievement of culture begins with attitude. 
It begins with attitude. Look with me again in verses 1 and following. Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Notice why Paul says he is a prisoner. He says, I'm a prisoner for the Lord. On behalf of the Lord, I'm a prisoner because I am extending and continue to extend the message of the Lord. That, that's the reason that Paul was a prisoner. He said, I encourage you, I urge you, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And, and here's how that looks. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So what Paul does here is he sets the tone for what the right attitude looks like by not giving an imperative command. You know, preachers and teachers, we love imperatives because there's no way getting around what an imperative is. An imperative is a statement clearly that says, do this. Now, I'm a pretty simple guy. I like pretty simple statements. I like very simple conversations. I like to simply be told by my loving wife, this is what I want for my birthday. You can tell her I said that too. Because she never tells me what she wants for her birthday. So, I don't know. Listen, I know I'm meddling, and I'm meddling in my own life here, but you can help me. You can partner with me in this. <laughs> By telling her, tell the man what you want for your birthday. If she wants a bear hunt, that's fine. We'll do that. But, you know, just whatever it is, be, be up front about it. I like imperatives. Because an imperative means that we have no question, we have no doubt about what's being done. We read verse, chapter 4, verse 1. And it almost seems as if we would expect Paul to give an imperative there. He said, hey, guys, Ephesians, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. But that's not what he does. He, he simply gives a strong exhortation. Now, there's a difference. One is a command with an expectation. One is an exhortation with a hope. And that's what he gives. He gives an exhortation, an encouragement, hoping that the Ephesians will follow through with it. He says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have called. Paul obviously thought that the manner of walking was both clear and right. He thought, listen, as followers of Jesus Christ, you should know how it is that you are to walk. It should be clear to you. And... Not only should it be clear to you, it should also be right in your side. And this is what Paul's saying. I urge you, walk in this way. But he realized that the church had to make up its mind that they were going to behave in a worthy manner. Now, that's the hardest thing, I think, about parenting is not just teaching the children what's right, but giving them the freedom to choose for themselves to do what is right. There, there's a difference between making someone do something and letting them choose to do something for themselves. Every day whenever, I'm, whenever that blessed season called school season is in session um, and I get to drop the kids off at school, I, I always tell both of them, say, set a good example today. I don't tell them be good, I don't tell them do good, I tell them set a good example. Because then they're being confronted with an opportunity every day to make the choice to do what is right, to do what's true, to do what honors God, to do what shows respect to the teacher. I, I want them to make that choice for themselves. And, and Paul wanted the Ephesians to do the same thing. He wanted the church to make up its mind to behave in a worthy manner. You know, we still have the same choice to make today as a church. Every local church does. We have to make the choice. Will we strive together in unity or will we bite and devour one another in jealousy? Turn with me in Galatians chapter 5, just a couple pages back. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Galatians 5.13 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. 
Notice, notice what Paul's saying there. You know, we like to talk about freedom. What Paul is saying is that it's selfishness that leads one to try and do what he wants to do. But it's freedom that allows one in humility to bless others. But that's what he's really pointing out here. He says, verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. See, there's a way that we can act as a church that will bring about our demise and will slander the good name of Jesus Christ. But there's also a way that we can behave as a church that will honor the name of Christ and will extend his gospel to others. That's how we want to act. We want to act in such a way that will bless others. And we have to make that choice. Every single church has to make that choice. And it's not a choice that you can make once and is good for 20 years. It's a choice that you have to make every single day as we guard one another's reputation, as we live with integrity, as we live as partners. So the manner is described that is worthy of living. The manner is described in Ephesians chapter 4 as being with, done with humility. Paul says, live worthy, walk worthy in a manner, walk in a manner worthy of the call into which you've been called with all humility. Do you think people ever confuse humility with a lack of confidence? I think sometimes people do. And it's actually kind of easy to, to do that. Like you don't believe that you're able to do something. And so you kind of have this fake humility and say, oh, no, no, don't, don't put me in the front. I, I, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't need any recognition. When really it's just they're scared they're not going to be able to accomplish the task. Hey, there are things I'm faced with every single day that I know I can't do. <laughs> doesn't mean I shouldn't try. I mean, other than flying, I shouldn't do that. But, but sometimes people confuse humility with a lack of confidence. But confident people can be very, very humble. And they can be humble and show that humility by looking to the needs of others before they look to their own needs. That's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. Verses 3 and 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others as better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Do you notice there that, that Paul doesn't say, hey, Zach, put your interests on the back burner and don't worry about them. He doesn't say that. He says, I can look at my own interests, but I can also at the same time look at the interests that you have as well. I don't have to... You know, being selfless doesn't mean that I'm stupid when it comes to caring for myself. It means that I, I'm not selfish in demanding my wants and wishes met, but I'm willing to fight for you at the same time. And so Paul says, have some humility. That's what's expected. That's what's right. He goes on and he says, have gentleness. Boy, this is, this is an area that God's dealing with me. Has been for a while. I'm, I'm a slow learner. But gentleness, this word, I think just about every time humility or gentleness are listed in the New Testament, I could be wrong on this, but I think just about every time these two words are always paired together. They're always together. They're together because gentleness has directly to do with not being overly impressed with oneself, which is humility. Humility. But gentleness follows humility. The reason you can be gentle in your response to others, the reason that you can be gentle in leadership, the reason you can be gentle in parenting, and that's where I'm struggling <laughs> a lot, the, the reason we can be gentle in those things is because of a humble spirit, of realizing that without God, we ain't got nothing. And so gentleness and humility are always paired together. In fact, I was thinking about this today. Um, if I wanted to contribute to an unhealthy culture in this church, then it would be easy to do so. All I have to do to contribute to an unhealthy culture is I have to find something that you do that I don't like or you do in a way I wouldn't do it and gripe at you about it. 
That's all I'd have to do. I mean, all I'd have to do is nitpick and bring something up, and I could help contribute to an unhealthy culture. In fact, it's not hard to find something to fight about. What's hard is finding something worth fighting about in the right way. But it's not hard to find something to fight about. It's not hard to find something to gripe about. There are people that their greatest satisfaction in life is picking a fight with someone else. You know this. You work with them. Maybe you live with them. It's not hard to find something to fight about. But if I'm going to have a gentle spirit, that means I'm going to be willing to look at others' needs as well as my own, which means I'm not going to be looking to fight. I'm going to be looking to bless. And that's what Paul urges the church to do. Live in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. He goes on. He says this looks like having patience. Now, the word patience doesn't mean the ability to not blow your top whenever the kid spills the milk. It doesn't mean not blowing your top whenever... The sound system doesn't work. It doesn't mean not blowing your top whenever somebody drives across the four-way stop in the wrong order and just then just decides that they did it wrong and stop in the middle of the intersection expecting you to finally go. They did that to me the other day. I'm glad there's not a Jesus sticker on the back of the church car because <laughs> I would have set a bad example. But patience in this sense means the state of being able to bear up under provocation. So when others are seeking to guile you, when others are seeking to, 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 to just prod you, when others are seeking to make you lose your temper, you patiently stand your ground because the unity of the body is not worth your minor inconveniences. That's patience. It's saying, whatever you're trying to do, it's not worth me losing it so that the unity of the body is sacrificed. The next one, he says, is bearing with one another in love. A, uh, a more direct translation of that is putting up with one another in love. I like that translation better. It just, you know, we do a lot of putting up with, don't we? You can be honest. You, you do a lot of putting up with, with me. I get that. I'm, I'm a person. I have a personality. And, you know, there's things that I'm going to do that you're just going to have to put up with me. And I'm just going to have to put up with you as well. Paul addresses the same thing in Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 12 and following. Colossians 3, 12. Paul says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. No, notice that, that language, put on. Paul uses it several times. But I, when I get dressed, I'm intentional with how I dress. I'm intentional about the shirt that I put on. I'm intentional about my jeans or shorts. I'm intentional about my socks and my shoes. Nobody dresses me. I have to intentionally choose to dress myself. And Paul's saying the exact same thing about our spiritual life. You have to intentionally choose how you're going to dress yourself each and every day. He says, make a choice then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, to put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And that phrase in 13, bearing with one another in love, means literally putting up with one another. Listen, I need to make the choice for the unity of the body to put up with you, even though you may drive me crazy because I love you in the Lord. And for the sake of the unity of the body, you need to make the choice to put up with me, even though I may drive you crazy, so that the body is blessed. It doesn't mean that we're above being called out when we sin. It just means that we realize the unity of the body is of greater worth than being bothered by personalities. The next thing he says is, you need to do all these things and be eagerly protecting the unity of the body of the spirit in the bond of peace. Notice what it is that maintains the unity. It's the bond of peace. 
Peace is the bond which God intends for us to use to protect the unity which his spirit has given to us. Unity is a gift from God. Maintaining unity in the church is the task of the church. That's the way that it works. James chapter 3 verse 18 says, Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. You know, we're all sowing something. We're all planting something in this church. Oh, that it would be righteousness that's sown in peace. So when we're talking about having unity for the sake of achieving a healthy culture within Lake Fork Baptist Church, we have to realize that it begins with attitude, having an attitude that says, not me only, not me first, but us. The second thing we have to do is we must realize that this unity is something which is expressed through grace. And Paul talked about this in verses 7 through 14. I'm going to skip down, actually, to verse 11. Well, well yeah, we'll start in verse, uh, verse 11. It says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes." This unity is expressed through grace, not our grace, but God's grace to us. And what we read is that God has provided a way to accomplish his objective of us living as mature Christians. Here's what he's done to accomplish this this objective of living as mature Christians. First of all, he has given gifts. In chapter 4, verse 11, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, teachers. This is different from the spiritual gifts we read about in 1 Corinthians. It's different from what we read about in Romans. This is the gifting of God, of gifted individuals to the church, which means that God has given, gave apostles for a purpose. He gave prophets for a purpose. He has given evangelists like Dennis, Irwin, as a purpose for the church. Dennis is an evangelist. I'm not. I'm a preacher who can preach evangelistically, but I'm not an evangelist in the same way that an evangelist is anointed by the Spirit of God. There is a difference in what we do. And the Scripture makes the point that we are gifted to the church, not because we're something special or something wonderful, but because God has a plan and He has a purpose. And to accomplish that purpose, He's given everything that's needed in his time, in his way, so that he alone receives the glory. God has given gifts to the church. Not only has he given gifts, but he's given these gifts purposefully. Notice the purpose for it in verse 12. For the equipping of the saints. Why? For ministry. For the building up of the body. I like this. If you ever needed an argument for why the ministerial staff is not supposed to do it all, look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Why does God give the gifts of ministers to the church? For equipping the church for works of service. That word equipping means training. Think about the Great Commission. Jesus said, teaching them to obey all that I have said. There's something that we need to learn. And if there's something we need to learn, then that means there is something which needs to be taught. And if there's something which needs to be taught, the best way for it to be taught is by a teacher, one who is knowledgeable and understanding, who can successfully pass on information so that individuals can make a choice to put what is received into practice. And that's what... Paul says has happened. There is a purpose behind the gifts that God has given to the church. Here's some good news, some great news. You ready for this? God desires, I didn't give you a chance to answer because I'm going to tell you anyways. God desires for every Christian to be trained for the work of ministry. That's a great place for a solid, hearty amen. Right there. God desires for every Christian to be trained for the work of ministry. You 
have something to give and contribute towards the unity of Lake Fork Baptist Church. I mean, isn't that great? God didn't gift any of us with the spiritual gift of griping, but he did grant to us or offer to us the gift of humility that comes by his spirit. This is great. God has a plan for you to contribute something profitable to Lake Fork Baptist Church. Not only that, but he also desires for you to be mature in Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to remain a spiritual infant. Instead, he wants you to grow into a fully functioning adult. The end of last week, our, our family, my, my side of the family, went up to Oklahoma and we uh, got to swim in the river and some other things. And, I mean, just the, the greatest thing about being a dad and uncle when it comes to vacation time is chunking the kids in the pool or in the river. I mean, wherever it is. That's just fun to do. And so I was taking turns, you know, throwing the kids up. And the older nephews are now like 11 and, and 10. And Copeland's about to be 10. And uh, I'm like, guys, I don't know if I can throw you. But, I mean, the, the uncle in me just said, well, we'll try it. It might have been the pride in me. Said we'll try it. And so I got them, and Ch Copeland's still, you know, a little string bing, so I can chunk him pretty good. The hardest thing about him is his height, but I can work around that. His, his cousin, I can still chunk him pretty good, but his oldest cousin, Tristan, who's 11, I, I got him about halfway out of the water. <laughs> and uh, I'm surprised I didn't throw my shoulder out, actually, in that throwing. But I realized, and I told Deanna, man, that season has changed just like that. You know, giving your kids shoulder rides has an unlimited number but a limited season, is what someone once said. Chunking them up in the air, you can do it as many times as you want to, but eventually it's going to end because these seasons change. Why? Because they're growing and they're maturing. As a parent, part of me weeps as my kids grow. But as a parent, part of me prays for them to grow. And the same is true for us as the children of the living God. God desires for us to grow into fully functioning adults. Notice what that means. That means that we're no longer children tossed back and forth by the waves. I love the first time we took Copeland to the beach. He was young. I don't know, maybe a year and a half or two. And, uh, you know, down in, in the Gulf, waves aren't really all that big to me, but I'm 6'2". And that's, that's not a big deal. But to someone that's this tall, those waves are gigantic. They're bigger than he is. And I, I have just this vivid picture of him being out in the ocean and just the power of the waves pushing him back and forth. And what Paul is saying is, is, is God's desire is not for you to be swayed back and forth by every wind, by every way of teaching, but to be firm, to be steady, to be solid in the teachings of Jesus Christ. And that's what we are working to achieve together. That's what your Sunday school teachers are helping to work towards. That's what the, the staff is working to help towards. That's what we all want to work towards, is to see one another steady and mature in Jesus Christ. And you have an essential part in that taking place. That's good news. That's great news that God desires for us to be secure in Jesus Christ. So not be taken captive by false teachings or by false doctrines or to be taken captive by human cunning, but instead to be solid in Jesus. He wants that for us. The third thing that happens when we see this unity being expressed properly so that culture is made that's healthy is we see growth that takes place in love. Verses 15 and 16 says, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. As the truth is spoken in love, God's people are, are permitted to grow. It's the, the pouring out from the watering can. That's love. It's the miracle grow that's being poured on the tomato plants. That's love. And as that love is poured out, growth is permitted. But notice how the, the, the truth is spoken. It's not spoken with frustration. It's not spoken with the intent to wound. You know, and I have to watch myself on this. I can speak the truth in a very horrible way that doesn't permit growth, 
but instead cuts down. But that's not what God's design is. God's design is for truth to be spoken in love for building up. There's a study that David Dykes at Green Acres Baptist put together, and it was used to, to train pastors around in other countries and things. But he, he made a statement in it that I, I love and it stuck with me. It's a simple statement. Healthy churches grow. Now, we're not just talking about numbers. What we're talking about is scriptural. Healthy churches grow because the church is the people. And when we're healthy, we have opportunities to be exposed regularly, regularly to sound doctrine and teaching and preaching that we may grow together in the faith. I'm concerned with church growth, but it's not a growth that's based on numbers. It's based upon maturity as we all grow in the knowledge and expression of true faith in Jesus Christ. But notice what has to happen for growth to take place. Each part must be doing its part properly. I can make all kinds of fancy messages and signs and catchphrases and you know, hashtags. I just like doing that. That's fun. That might be old people stuff right there, Emily. Sorry. <laughs> Hashtag old right there. <laughs> Dork. I mean, any of those things. It's just great. You can do any of that. I don't remember what I was saying. <laughs> old. <laughs> See, it happened. Uh, but anyways, we can do all kinds of things that are catchy, but until we play our parts in Jesus Christ as gifted by his spirit, until we play our part faithfully, and humbly, and in gentleness, the growth that God desires will not take place. Because there must be healthy activity. It's the whole reason those who go to space have to ride a bicycle in space because atrophy takes place when muscles aren't used. I want to ask you this evening, are you flexing your spiritual muscles? Are you flexing them for the glory of God because of the grace of God and for the building up of his church? Are you doing your part to contribute to a healthy culture in Lake Fork Baptist Church so that we might grow together in Jesus Christ? I'm so grateful to get to be part of this church. God's doing a great work, and I believe he's going to do a greater work. What a privilege it is to partner with you in ministry. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day, and we ask that as we go from this place tonight, you'll let us grow, let us go in joy. God, we do pray also for growth, that we'll see the growth that you most desire, and that we'll see that growth because we are living in faithful submission to you. Help us, please, God, each and every day to make the choice to contribute to a healthy culture in Lake Fork Baptist Church. God, please do something that is bigger than us, something which only you can do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I want to give you this word of encouragement before we uh, head out. Our community groups are going to start off on Sunday evening, August the 1st. There's some sign-up sheets out there in the foyer. I encourage you to be part of one of those groups. Uh, there will be some groups meeting up here at the church, but I'm just going to be up front with you about this, okay? You ready? This is just 100% honesty. It will be a better experience in a home. It'll be a better experience in a home. So if you're able to get into a home, if you're comfortable doing that, please do that. If not, being here at the church would be 100% better than just not <laughs> doing it. So I want you to do it, but I really want you to participate in the home. So would you please consider signing up and, and joining this uh, little experiment together as we study God's word from Matthew chapter 6. Have a great night.